Okay, hello. Um, thank you and welcome for or, welcome for <laughs> welcome to our live session today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm a little tired, but it's okay. We're gonna get through this together because we have a wonderful professional here to share her journey with us. So I'm gonna be going over a quick startup presentation to you know welcome you all to the shadowing session and introduce you to our program if you have not um, come to one of our virtual shadowing sessions before. So let's get started. Um, my name is Asher Castro, he, him, his, and I am the Chief of Diversity here at Tree Health Shadowing. Tree Health Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, and woman-led nonprofit that is dedicated to helping free healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their dem demographic identity or financial ability. So um, just to let you guys know, we do have closed captions for all of our sessions. And this is available at the bottom of the screen. We want to accommodate all students of all abilities. So if you guys have um, ideas about how we can do that, how we can be more inclusive as an organization, um, please send us an email at info at And if you have difficulty enabling the closed captions, feel free to direct message me or another one of my teammates to help you out. So um, we are, An international organization. And so if you guys can just please drop in the chat where you're zooming from, we'd love to see where everybody is located at today. Awesome. We've got people from all over the place. Yeah, um, just everyone's reference, I'm in DC right now and it is finally, finally spring. <laughs> Hopefully I say that now, but tomorrow it'll be like 32 degrees out. Um, so we just want to keep you guys up to date and in the loop with all of our amazing opportunities and events that we are having. So um, be sure to go to freehouseshadowing.com and sign up for our email list. Promise we do not spam. We only send one email a week and it'll just have all the sessions and events that are um, upcoming. So you can also follow us on TikTok and Instagram. We are active on both the social media platforms to just kind of stay in the know. Just some opportunities I'd like to touch on um, to all of our students which as part of being pre-health shadowing. So first things first, we have Kaplan. We partnered with Kaplan to get you guys access to free resources as well as a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products. Make sure to fill out the survey in the chat and we will get you hooked up with this. We will also be um, giving out a Kaplan scholarship in a couple of weeks. So look forward to that as well. And we have also partnered with Neolith, and Neolith is an online mental health platform for students. Um, we know that college and young adulthood is pretty stressful, and that's as it is, um, especially in pandemic times. So we encourage you guys to make use of this platform. It's also a way to, um, you know, get expose yourself to some of the different um, issues that we're dealing with right now, uh, mental, social, emotional, all those wonderful things that do come along with the physical processes that we treat, at, that we will be treating as future professionals. So just some things to think about. And if you use the code prehealth to sign up, you can get, um, you can get started for free on that platform today. So um, we would also like to draw your attention to Mass for Mass. Mass for Mass is an amazing women-led organization, which is perfect for Women's History Month. And they donate four masks for every four masks sold to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. These include people in the homeless community, healthcare workers without proper PPE, and just anyone who in general is struggling to stay safe right now. With our discount code, PHS15, um, you can get 15% off your order. And if you buy through this method, PHS will also earn 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs fully off of the support and hard work of our students. So if you would like to play a bigger role in supporting pre health shadow, we would love for you to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be part of our team and play a part in the administrative tasks and lead students in various projects, initiatives, professional, just professional outreach or grant writing. Um, but we do understand that not everyone has the time to commit to this right now. And so we do offer asynchronous volunteer opportunities where you can um, earn volunteering hours at your own time when you have the chance to. 
so. Um, we'd love to invite you to be a part of our program and contribute your own unique perspective. So I look forward to seeing some of your applications soon. If you are a high school student and you want to get more involved in Free House Seattle, we've got you covered as well. Um, we have started a new program called High School Training for Pre-Health Shadowing. And if you follow the link, um, it's the same as the other volunteering link, and you sign up and apply through our website to indicate you are interested in our high school training program, and we can get you hooked up with some of our um, guidance from as college students, and then also get you kind of networking with other high school students, learning how to apply to, you know, college not only colleges, but also teacher professional schools. It's a great way to, you know, find some new resources and kind of, you know, enhance your resume while you're still young. So if you are get interested in getting published, um, we want to recognize all the hard work of our students in the program. So you can submit essays, reflections, research papers, reviews to our editor in chief through the link that will be dropped in the chat. And this, you will have the opportunity to have your work featured on our website. And this is, you know, it'll look good on CVs, applications, resumes, et cetera. So I encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. And it's also just a great way to share writing and give you a little bit of initiative in some of the research that maybe you want to do in the future. So um, we are a, as I mentioned before, an international program that is led by minorities and women. And so part of our mission here at PHS is to promote diversity. And so we are going to be hosting at least monthly diversity panels focused on different topics to highlight the different disparities and encourage education about some of the different challenges that are faced by different populations in the medical field. So some of these upcoming events um, include an all-female panel for Women's History Month, which I'll be touching on in a moment, um, also a COVID-19 roundtable and an international student forum. If you have a mentor, a professor, or a professional that has inspired you and you think could contribute to these conversations, um, go ahead and nominate them today using the link in the chat, and we hope to see you at some of these events. So um, it is Women's History Month, as I've mentioned, and so this weekend, um, myself and a couple other of our team members are going to be hosting a woman-led panel on the 27th and the 28th, so it's a sun Saturday and Sunday. Um, I encourage you guys to sign up. You can scan the QR code on the screen. And you, um, I'd love to see you guys there and attend. We will have a hour and a half long discussion. Uh, it'll be about the different disparities that females face in the healthcare field, what we can do to further education for young women, and also just the general challenges and stigma and stereotypes that are unfortunately still experienced by many who identify as female in society today. So if you'd really like to join us for that and contribute to that conversation, make sure to sign up for free using the QR code. If you would like more information or the direct link, you can also DM me in the chat and I'll get to you. So um, if you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our organization. As I said before, PL Shattering is a completely student-run organization and we're working around the clock and around the world to keep this up, program up and running for you. So um, unfortunately, our website and Zoom are not free services, and we do have to pay for those, um, even though we try to keep everything free for you guys. So if you have a couple of dollars, one, two, maybe three, if you're feeling extra, you know, like you really want to give to us today, um, you can go ahead and invite you to donate through, our, through the QR code or on our website. Again, we don't expect this, and it's obviously not an obligation, but um, we do encourage that you just kind of spread the word about the opportunities we're giving and the things we're trying to promote as a pro-health equity platform. So throughout the session today, please type your questions in the chat. Um, myself and the other team members will be taking those questions down to ask at the second half of the session during the Q&A. Um, we also will invite you to you know, raise your hand or come off mic if you do want to ask a question directly to a professional. So stay tuned for that. Make sure to take good notes because we there will be a virtual a post shadowing assessment that you can take to earn your virtual shadowing hours for to come into the session today. I will go into detail about that later at the end of the presentation. So make sure you stick around. Okay, one last note. If you can, please turn your cameras on. It just makes it a little more personable and we'd love to see more than just a couple of black screens on here. 
So it, yeah, but thank you guys so much for joining us today. And thank you for listening to my feel as always. Um, I would love to welcome our professional and um, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm Dr. Ditti Munkur. I am an internal medicine physician in San Diego, um, California. And I'm really happy to be here today to just give you a snapshot of my journey, uh, the different ups and downs through the process of becoming a physician and to answer any questions you might have uh, regarding um, internal medicine, med school, um, and any other questions uh, to, for you to become a physician in the future. Shall I start? Okay. Yes, please. All right. So, well, this is where I was born. Um, this is Goa in India, and uh, it's a beautiful coastal town. I lived about a three to four hour drive south from here for most of my life. And my medical schooling was also um, in India. This is- oh, um, uh, yeah. Sorry, if you wanna start sharing your screen, I don't think- I Oh, you're not seeing the screen. Oh, sorry, my bad. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm sorry about that. Let me see. Share screen. Do you see it now? Yes, perfect. Thank All you. All right, so much. sorry, you just missed some of the photographs of India. <laughs> so this is this is where I was born, um, Goa in India, and this is my school. Um, honestly, we had benches and desks. This was just probably an event where we had to just you know get together, and so those uh, those big uh, rooms used to not have benches and desks. But this is this is literally my uniform back in India and all those pigtails that we had to have um, back in school. And this is my this is my medical school that I went to at Corn Manipal University. They do have two um, uh, medical colleges back in India, one in Manipal and one in Mangalore, which is about a half an hour drive from Manipal. And they have some, uh, I think American University of Antigua in Caribbean, um, is also run by Manipal University. This is uh, my graduation from uh, San U UC San Diego with my master's in clinical research. And uh, this was when I moved from India after finishing medical school, I uh, finished all my United States medical licensing exams. And then I was waiting in that gap year, uh, you could say between um, finishing med school and then starting residency. And so I, I did this master's in clinical research um, after some volunteering in research. And then before you, knew, you know, I already was a resident at Uni um, sorry, UCSF uh, Fresno in California. And uh, it was time to review their favorite resident. I happened to be uh, <laughs> their favorite resident, which I find uh, uh, myself lucky um, to be considered so. And this was uh, one of our quality improvement projects, um, which was an interdisciplinary project with fellows presenting, residents presenting on different specialties, surgery, ob um, just in general, um, you know, trying to, trying to all display our research skills and uh, we won the first place um, at UCSF Fresno. And so this is all the training I've had. Um, UCSD Masters in Clinical Research, UC San Francisco resident training in the Fresno campus um, in internal medicine. And then uh, I'm American Board of Internal Medicine uh, certified. I uh, have my Manipal University Med Schooling up here. And then I also did um, a primary care psychiatry fellowship because in second year of internal medicine residency, I pretty much decided that I wanted to do outpatient medicine, uh, which is what uh, we call primary care. And um, this fellowship seemed to really help me um, help my patients, not just with their physical health, but also with mental health, especially in these 
you know, lately we, we see a huge burden of mental health issues in terms of anxiety, depression, PTSD. So it did, this fellowship did help me really uh, improve my, you know, communication with my patients as well as develop strong uh, and healthy doctor patient relationships. So now I've done all this, what next? Um, have you heard of Ikigai? Can we have the polling question, please? Okay, guys, uh, make sure to go ahead and put in your vote. If you have not, we've got most respondents. So I'll give you guys about five more seconds. Okay. Sounds like not a lot of people. So I guess we are all going to be learning something today. Yes, yes. I, I learned this um, during my residency training. So it's a Japanese concept of um, figuring out the reason for, you know, the reason for your being and how you could help decide, um, how could you could help yourselves decide about what you want to do in the future based on your, your reason for, you know, being. And so this is a vision board, and this is my vision board. All of you are gonna have your own vision boards and it's important to have a vision board because you want to know what you wanna achieve. And it's easier to um, achieve your goals if you can visualize them. So on top, you can see I want to be a doctor. I also like to paint and um, you know, right now on the, on the side, I, I have a few, uh, uh, clients who are interested in my watercolor art and I um, sell my paintings. And I also, uh, you know, love music um, and want to have a family. We already have a puppy, so that's that part's done. But we, life is not just about your career. There's always going to be a balance you want to uh, meet. So Ikigai is this Venn diagram where you can see the intersection of what you love, what you love to do, what the world needs, what you, you can be paid for, and what you're good at. So if you have um, a career that path that you need to choose, you have to make sure it meets all of these criteria as much as, it, as, much as you can, because if you fixate on just one of these, then you might not be um, you know, happy down the road because you, if you do what you love, but it doesn't pay, then you won't have an income and you won't be happy. So it's important to focus on this no matter what you choose in the future. Of course, most of you are pre-med, so I'm hoping uh, uh, you know any profession in medicine is gonna give you enough of an income, but you can then also look at what you love. Do you like surgery? Do you like you know uh, the thinking portion of medicine? So you could become an internal medicine doctor. Do you like kids to be a pediatrician? So this concept of Ikigai is really, really uh, interesting. All right, so we have another polling question for internal medicine. Okay, make sure to get your votes in there if you haven't already. Oh, awesome. Yeah, it looks like you have um, some people to convince, but definitely have a chance today. <laughs> Good, so I have a chance to change your minds. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so my chosen career, internal medicine, and direct primary care. I don't know if you've heard of this before because a lot of physicians themselves haven't heard of direct primary care. So the way internal medicine uh, training works is you learn how to take care of patients who are ho hospitalized and adult patients. So this is different from pediatrics, which would be kids that the doctor is taking care of. 
but internal medicine focuses only on adult patients, 18 years, and you know, as long as these patients live. Um, so internal medicine could be, uh, you know, this training will allow you to either become a primary care doctor who works in um, an outpatient clinic and sees about 20 to 30 patients a day in the current insurance phase model, uh, is able to take care of high blood pressure, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, and you know, gout and a bunch of heart failure, and, um, uh, kidney issues, liver failures, all these uh, patients who come in, come in with symptoms that can be managed at home um, and also for a lot of preventive stuff. So that's outpatient medicine. And then there's hospital medicine where patients are a little too sick to be at home um, while they're trying to get over this infection, maybe pneumonia, or it could be a heart failure exacerbation, or they're having you know, bleeding from their gut, um, which needs more closer monitoring. And that would be hospital medicine. So internal medicine graduates either go out to be primary care doctors or hospital medicine doctors, or they could become um, specialty trained so they can go forward into three years of cardiology or two years of kidney nephrology, um, two years of endocrinology where they treat thyroid uh, issues um, and other you know, different hormonal issues. And so there's a plethora of specialist uh, options that you can have beyond internal medicine training. Internal medicine training is three years of training after finishing med school. Um, in India, I had to finish four and a half years of med school and then a year of internship uh, because it follows the British uh, medical school um, um, structure. And so when I moved here, I had to do an extra intern year, which is done as part of residency training in uh, the US. So medical school, there was a polling question on this. Shall we have it? Awesome. Almost everyone. That is awesome. So I'll tell you a little bit about how med school is going to be like. So this is an example of the curriculum from Emory University. Um, so you can see it's one, two, three, four years, and then graduation. Oops. Oops, oops, oops. Sorry. Okay. So the first year, in the first year, you would learn uh, healthy humans. So anatomy, so there's gonna be dissection, you go into a dissection hall and then you dissect different uh, organs from the cadavers and try to learn about different structures, the nerves, the muscles, and learn all the names of those uh, organs and muscles. And, um, and then you also learn physiology, that's how the normal human body should function. And then you learn um, biochemistry, which is um, really, or, you know, chemistry that's specific to how the human body functions. Uh, different diseases that have, uh, you know, uh, biochemical disorders or enzymes that we are missing out in our, uh, when we are born, which, which is called inborn errors of metabolism. And so all of those things you would learn in, in your first year. And then you also learn um, a little bit of uh, pharmacology, um, that's learning about medications. This is through for a second, third year. You would learn about uh, microbiology, about different, uh, you know, uh, infections, bacteria, bugs, uh, viruses, parasites. And then you'll do certain examinations and um, of stool and not always pleasant. Uh, even, even the uh, dissection halls have that strong smell of formalin. Um, at least back in those days, um, I'm not sure now, but I'm sure there's better um, you know, uh, yeah, systems to aerate the lab and have it, have it a little better for your eyes um, as, and they don't burn as much. Um, so I think, I think for the most part, medical school would, 
would be uh, a new type of experience. It's it's not it's not just like sitting in a class. It's going it's going to be a lot of hands on work, um, and then slowly in third year, fourth year, you start doing clinical um, rotations. So you would go into the hospital, and then you'll have patients to follow, and then you learn from residents. Um, and at the same time, you're learning uh, the theory aspect with, with all these diseases and um, different organ systems and their functions. So your clinical skills would involve core clerkships. And there's also certain uh, portions of the year that you would be doing, where you would be doing a few research projects, um, et cetera. And then um, the final year is almost as, uh, you know, uh, you're almost functioning um, like a resident at certain rotations called sub-internships. Uh, sub and I did a few electives when I moved from um, uh, India. So I did uh, pulmonology, that's the lung rotation for a, mo for a month or two, and then nephrology at uh, University of Alabama in Birmingham. And then I also did nephrology rotations at UC Davis. And then, you know, you graduate from med school and then you venture into internal medicine. Now I chose internal medicine. I also had an option to choose family medicine or psychiatry. Th these are the most common um, options that you know, immigrants who have visa issues like myself when, when I first moved, really we, we don't have a whole lot of options sadly because um, you know, American grads do get uh, extra um, um, benefit in their CV just because of the visa. And so a lot of programs don't even uh, consider um, visa students. Um, so I, I had to choose something that really was realistic and I happened to like internal medicine anyway. So I chose internal medicine, which is essentially preventing, diagnosing and treating all adult diseases. So you can see this is a pediatrician who's working with kids and family medicine doctors kind of work with kids as, a, as well as adults. Uh, their rotations are really focused more on outpatient medicine than inpatient and ICU. But internal medicine, we focus a lot on hospital uh, rotations and we, we have a lot more ICU rotations and we can even go forward to become critical care fellows and ICU specialists. So now I'm going to show you a snapshot of each year. So first year of internal medicine, this is what it looks like. A bunch, a big chunk of your first year is going to be inpatient rotations. And I'll run uh, through a typical day of an intern. Um, and then you can kind of get an idea of how most of the intern days are going to go. Uh, and then outpatient consults, uh, outpatient services and consults are both a little bit lighter rotation. So outpatient would be, we used to either go to the veterans hospital and work in the clinics there uh, in Fresno in Central Valley, or we would uh, be working in another um, federally qualified health center, which was a clinic. So essentially you go in at 8 a.m. You have um, a bunch of patients on the list that would be roomed by the medical assistant. Then you walk in there, you um, get history, examine the patient and come up with a plan for the patient. And then you go back to your uh, attending or the professor and present your case, give the history, give your plan. And then you walk back in with your attending into the patient's room and you, you know, kind of explain everything to the patient, come up with a plan, order lab tests or you know, prescribe medications. Uh, or any imaging or any other tests. And then you, um, that's how you kind of work in the outpatient setting. So that's the workflow. And consults is basically, it could be any specialty. It could be cardiology, it could be rheumatology. Um, you would be following a team led by a cardiologist or a rheumatologist respectively. And then you have different patients where you focus on only that particular specialty related uh, health issue and try to help the primary team, which could be a hospitalist team, help these patients um, get you know, better and then get discharged from the hospital. So it could be, um, it could be you know, a little bit based on what you choose. If you, if you know you wanna be a cardiologist, you could uh, request for more cardiology uh, consult rotations. 
So that, that's one of those. And then you do emergency medicine and research uh, for a month or two. And then there's a month of vacation usually. And then second year postgraduate, um, it's a little bit less inpatient compared to the first year. And um, there's a lot of uh, research and that could be quality improvement projects and research is kind of important, even though you might not, not everyone will be interested in research, but it's important because most of clinical uh, data that comes out, you know, about different medications, um, different um, blood tests or different decisions that you have to make for your patient uh, in terms of their health, it all comes out as research studies. So even if you don't want to actively be performing research trials, uh, and that's not kind of, you know, uh, an, an appealing thing to you, then you would still benefit though from these research electives um, to learn about how to read a research article and get the best, um, you know, kind of judge based on your learning about the biases in the research, the pros and cons of, uh, you know, um, of, of that particular research study. And if there's certain limitations and whether that result is actually uh, able to be extrapolated to your patient population. So this also, the same PGY year um, two also has about four weeks vacation. And then PGY year, that's three, postgraduate year three um, uh, is about really about now, now you're all set and you're going to start either uh, you know working in a clinic by yourself or um, uh, go into, your, into a hospital setting and work as an independent doctor. So this is pretty much the last year before you go out in the wild world and function on your own. Um, so this year is essentially light. It's a lot of outpatient rotations and you can even pick and choose electives like I chose endocrinology because I know thyroid and other hormonal issues are really common um, in the outpatient world as, as primary care doctor. And also I chose orthopedics because all these joint pains and knee pains and back pains, so common. Um, and it would be nice for me to have those rotations so I can learn about it and help my patients in the future instead of choosing, um, let's say ICU as an elective because I don't intend to work in an ICU setting. So you get to choose a lot um, of your rotations in your third year. Do you have any questions so far? Any comments? Um, and then I can proceed. Um, we can let you finish your presentation and just take our questions at the end of the session if that's easier. Oh, awesome. awesome, that works for me, thank you. So this is a day in the life of an intern. And it's a steep learning curve. So your first year as an internal medicine resident uh, is called an internship. Um, so generally, we also work along with psychiatry uh, residents who do a one year uh, prelim in, I think it's about six months, not a full year, six months of internship with us. And um, also I have noticed a different, you know, other specialties like radiology, ophthalmology, they also end up doing one prelim year as an internal medicine intern. And then they move on to their specialties while we move into second year and third year. So a day in the life of an intern, and because most interns do inpatient medicine, kind of went through the inpatient uh, hospital medicine routine. So we first show up at 6 a.m. in the morning. We take sign out from the night team. So there's a team that was taking care of your patients at night. And uh, you have a team made of uh, yourself, an intern, and another intern. And then there's usually a senior resident, could be a PGY2, that's second year resident or a third year resident who's just about to graduate. And there's a professor or an attending on that team. You could also have med students with you who are rotating as part of their clerkships. And we get sign out. Sign out is essentially um, just any updates on what happened with that patient at night. So did they you know, have pain at night or did they have a bowel movement where there was blood or you know, any significant event uh, that the nurse might have notified the night intern, uh, they'll pass on to you and they'll tell you what they did about it so you can follow up. And then you go and pre-round. 
So pre-rounding is essentially you sit in front of the computer, you pull out the patient chart and you look at all the events that happened uh, through the night. There's lots of nursing notes. And then you look at their blood pressure, their temperature, their heart rate, all their objective vital signs and see if there was any fevers at night or anything went wrong with their heart rate. Was there a rapid response called, meaning the patient was sick and they had to call overhead and people had to come in and help them with the breathing maybe or helping the heart rate get back to normal. So you can see all the stuff that happened at night um, or since you left um, the previous day. And then you can uh, also kind of get all the blood, blood test related information because most patients who stay in the hospital generally get blood tests done every day, at least a few, because that's what we are trending to decide if they're ready for discharge. And so you would get all that information, write it in your uh, you know, notes, and then you go and see each of these patients that are assigned to you. So you go to their beds, um, you ask them how they're feeling, um, and you uh, might be at the same time getting new admissions, new patients who are being admitted to the hospital from the emergency room. So you might have to, you know, um, stop seeing these patients and go admit another patient or your senior might take care of the admissions for a bit and you continue to pre-round. So it really depends on the dynamic between you and your um, uh, attending, the professor and the seniors on the team. There's always a structure that everyone defines. And then um, once you pre-round, uh, pre-rounding also includes coming back to your, um, you know, that, um, I don't know, it's, it, it might be a room where all of you meet, all the residents, the uh, med student and the professor. So before the attending comes in, you could discuss with your senior about your plan for that patient. So you know all their blood tests, you spoke to the patient, you examined them and you, you have a plan uh, for that patient for that day. And then you think ahead and kind of decide what might happen, you know, you kind of predict what might happen tomorrow and decide when they might be uh, ready for discharge. And if they are close to, uh, you know, uh, discharge, you want to make sure there's physical therapy, things like that already rolling in. Um, so you're ready for, you know, making sure the patient is safe to go home. So pre-rounding is essentially working with your senior resident and doing your homework to know what's best for your patient for that day. And then you do bedside rounds. So some attendings generally do bedside rounds because they also want to you know, show you how to do a good physical exam. Uh, they want to also make sure that you got good history by asking the patient themselves. Um, so only rarely though, sometimes if there's a lot of teaching that the attending or professor wants to do, then they would just do uh, you know, office rounds or like computer rounds where you just sit next to the computer and kind of discuss about every patient. But generally for good training, for good internal medicine training, you want to do bedside rounds because physical exam is key. And then noon, we have conference so on different topics. The, uh, there would be educational sessions, some, you know, maybe a professor will talk about any, you know, particular specific disease or a uh, particular medication. And then you could, um, Listen on, listen in, and and have your lunch, and you know you've got to grab as much as you can during residency in terms of knowledge from wherever you can. Um, but these conferences in some uh, medical school, uh, sorry, uh, residency training programs, these conferences are structured as a full, you know, a full day of uh, conferences, and then um, you might not have these noon sessions as much. So the full day or a half day of academic sessions only actually allows you to stay focused on the teaching instead of lunch. And you also uh, get to keep your pager uh, with your senior resident. So you don't keep, you know, don't keep getting paged about your patient all the time and getting distracted. So we had, I think two of our years, we had uh, academic half days, where half of our uh, day for the week was, you know, um, solely for uh, academic purposes with no, um, clinical uh, work during those hours. So what happens is then you come back after lunch and you uh, now have to decide if you want to start certain medications for the patient, change the doses of the medications, or do some procedures. Like for example, if a patient has uh, liver disease and it's end stage liver disease and they have fluid filling in their belly and you need to tap it and you need to remove that fluid, 
or you could be having a procedure where let's say the patient needs dialysis and you need to put a line that goes in their neck for dialysis. So you generally get supervised by your senior resident who is signed off for those procedures. And then as you finish five to six procedures or sometimes even 10 procedures with, and, and the um, supervisor is confident that you can perform them on your own, you would get signed off. And by second year and third year, you will be supervising um, the interns. And then you will also discharge patients who are ready for discharge. You'll make sure all the medications are sent to them from the pharmacy um, and they have all the instructions they need before they go. Um, also, just a key point is during this whole day, you have all these things um, as part of the structure of the day. But at the same time, you have your pager on and you will keep getting pages from, let's say, the pharmacist or uh, the nurse who's taking care of the patient. And they'll have questions for you about, okay, what do I do? His potassium is, uh, you know, 3.5. This is a common one. Potassium is an electrolyte we check on most patients who are either on medications for heart failure and we are trying to diurese them, meaning trying to make them pee out a lot of urine so their heart goes back to a normal, you know, non-heart failure mode. And so when patients are given these medications, they sometimes lose their electrolytes. Their potassium goes really low. And so we need to replete the potassium. So um, generally we have to give potassium pills or IV potassium, depending on how bad it is. Um, so these are certain page, uh, you know, pages. I don't know if this, we had pagers until now. I think some places have phones, work phones that they give you and that'd be awesome because those pages are so archaic. Um, um, outpatient medicine. So I told you about one of the end uh, end uh, points from internal medicine can be outpatient medicine, where you function as a primary care doctor, where you don't deal with urgent issues as much, maybe a little bit, but not so much as uh, you know things that would need hospitalization. So you're generally looking at patients who who are going home after they see you and are relatively doing well. They just uh, need a lot of uh, continued. Uh, you know, long-term care from you um, in terms of back and forth, follow-up and um, changes in medication doses and stuff. So outpatient medicine is generally for people who are interested in having a long-term uh, longitudinal relationship with their patients where they get to know the patient and can help them throughout their, you know, a health journey. But if you are more of a kind who wants to just help patients during, um, during a hospital stay and then, you know, discharge the patient and you're not essentially a, a doctor, doctor for that particular patient. You just took care of that, you know, hospitalization issue. You took care of it and, you know, bye-bye, you know, you don't take care of that patient anymore. So some, some doctors like that hospitalist lifestyle of um, 12, on, 12, hour, 12 days on, 12 days off, or 15 days on, 15 days off of a long 12-hour uh, shift. And outpatient is more of a, outpatient medicine is more of a, a primary care approach, which I have, which is nine to five jobs and weekends are off. So why I did direct primary care and what is direct primary care? So essentially I try to remove all the obstacles that make it harder for patients to get care. So if they don't have insurance, uh, I can still see these patients because I use uh, an affordable membership fee for all my patients to see me. Even if patients have insurance, I don't uh, bill their insurance company for my time for the appointment and my services because insurance just has become a big ordeal for doctors to deal with in terms of paperwork. And, and there's uh, no control on the patient's expenses. I will order a bunch of tests and then insurance will charge them a ridiculous amount. So I wanted to change this and um, because it felt like we were losing compassionate medicine so right now the, the DPC model, direct primary care model is followed by about 1,500 physicians all over the United States. It's almost like private practice uh, blended with concierge medicine because my patients can text me, email me directly, which is not so common in the insurance based world uh, where patients have to, you know, I have a call center where they call and then wait, I have long wait times on the phone uh, until they get to speak with a medical assistant or a doctor. So with my patients, they can contact me directly. Also because I have less paperwork, 
I can actually dedicate that time to directly speak with my patients. So I remove any insurance based, uh, you know, uh, paperwork of complicated claims, denials of medications, and different middlemen that kind of uh, came in the way of my relationship with my patients. So I'm eliminating all of that. Um, I bring discount blood tests and discount imaging for my patients. And if they do have insurance, I can still use insurance for um, making sure patients have, um, you know, the, the imaging and blood tests covered by insurance. But then again, there's like a bunch of paperwork to do, which I generally like to avoid if it's a, if it's a very reasonable fee for those blood tests or uh, imaging. So the goal is to have less hurdles to treatment so I can actually give my patients the care they need when they need it the most. Because if insurance has denied them, let's say metformin and their diabetes kept, you know, keep getting worse and worse and then they end up in the hospital because of acidosis, you know, too much acid buildup from untreated diabetes. So I'm trying to avoid the cost uh, of healthcare from hospitalizations, ICU stays, and also in terms of how the patient feels when they come out, you know, of the hospital, it's going to be really a big, uh, you know, you know a downhill course when they go into the hospital and then have to be brought back to revive to life. So this model helps me give patients care when they need it. Um, I work solo. I don't have any assistance. And honestly, I do it because I want to see fewer patients uh, and make sure that I provide quality care for these patients instead of seeing 3,000 patients and 30 patients a day which is currently the insurance-based model for primary care, where we essentially get barely any time with patients, just 10 minutes with each patient. Uh, it, it was an assembly line of like, it really, you know, sad to see the state of uh, uh, insurance-based healthcare in these days, but I'm glad that I got an outlet in terms of direct primary care to spend more time with getting good history and uh, today I was able to see one of my patients where, I, where they had uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And honestly, if I hadn't spent that much time discussing it, I would have only focused on joint pains and not really caught uh, the carpal tunnel syndrome. So it's really important to get good history and get enough time with your patients. And then you have a doctor patient team and patients have to do their part with lifestyle changes, um, you know, choosing the right foods exercising well, avoiding substance use, and then you do your part in making sure they are empowered, plus they have, uh, you know, the right medications on board to get better if they have um, certain diseases that require treatment until the life, lifestyle changes kick in. So that's how my happy doctor was born. I'm the founder and um, internal medicine physician at my happy doctor, which is a direct primary care practice. I do house calls. Uh, because I want to avoid the expenses in terms of uh, brick and mortar office and then having, uh, you know, a bunch of employees that, uh, that I have to, you know, keep, keep uh, uh, you know, I have to keep my overhead low because I'm trying to see fewer patients um, and, and avoid having too much of an expense in running my practice. Um, because then what happens is I'll end up seeing more patients, 3000 patients, which is just again, going to reduce the quality of care that I uh, provide. And I also do video calls. Uh, because of the pandemic, patients are so much more open to telemedicine than ever before. It's like a genie that's come out of the bottle and honestly, is no way going back into the bottle. So um, I do 80% of my um, medical care is via telemedicine, unless I think they need an exam in person, then I would do a house call. Oh, nice. We have a question, holding question. Go ahead and make sure you put in your vote if you haven't already. Okay, going to give everyone about five more seconds. And okay, let's see. looks like a mix of both people yeah. are yeah i think yeah. that's awesome that's awesome because you do yeah i'm honestly really impressed that you do recognize that physical exam is key to a lot of things it's hard to get you know that um physical exam where you check uh, for ankle swelling 
and that would really be helpful to know how much of your diuretic dose that you need to have for your heart failure patients. It's hard to do it via telemedicine. You could try and, you know, uh, you, uh, under your supervision, the patient could palpate and help you decide how much the swelling is, but it's really not going to be um, the best way. And it's always important to try and have a good mix of uh, telemedicine and house calls. That's why I do house calls. Um, I had to make all these changes in my practice because initially I was, I was employed and uh, I didn't get to make um, decisions about my practice because obviously I was working for an employer and you're just a tool in a toolbox when you have a large healthcare system that employs you. Um, they'll make you they'll make you see a lot of patients because then you have to you know bill for that many patients and then the the income is based on how many patients you see. But my goal is to have a fixed let's say one fifty to two hundred patients, which will still allow me to have a salary which is similar to my employed salary. But I'll be able to give more time to my patients, build more meaningful relationships, help them avoid hospitalizations, know that it's inexpensive for them to do blood tests through me. Um, by using the direct primary care model. So my typical day will be, um, I, a lot of uh, um, students have asked me about shadowing um, with me, but it's hard for me to really actually do uh, shadowing um, through my type of practice because it's mostly telemedicine. I answer text messages from my patients. I you know, call my patients if there's blood test results that I want to discuss. And then I also um, have to you know, send out emails um, to patients based on our discussions and if there's you know, new follow-up or new results. Um, I also have to order blood tests, which um, through my practice, my patients don't have this um, you know, anxiety about how much it's gonna cost because I tell them the prices beforehand. Some of the blood tests are about $3 for the complete blood count, $4 for, so it's ex extremely inexpensive, 90% discount compared to the insurance-based model, which is available because of group purchasing by you know, multiple private practice doctors who kind of pull together and try to get the best pricing from these labs. Um, so I order all these blood tests, I order imaging, which is CT scans, MRIs, then I you know, work with my medical record system to make sure all the preventive stuff is uh, done for my patients in terms of mammograms and colonoscopy. So what is due for each patient is done. Um, so most, most of my day is this, and then uh, about two days a week or a day a week, I'll spend on house calls. So I'll go drive up to uh, different locations where most of my patients are, and then I try and do house calls all at once for those uh, specific locations. So here's a case we have. So Peter is a 41 year old African American male. And this is how you would be presenting to um, your attending or this is how your question will be on your exams. So Peter is a 41 year old African American male who uh, presented to your clinic two days ago, complaining of awakening with severe eight out of 10 left knee pain, erythema, which is redness and swelling three days prior. Peter states the pain was in and all around the joint area. Peter denied being able to ambulate without his wife's assistance and stayed home from work as a teacher. He thought he overdid it playing with his kids. The pain persisted throughout the day despite taking two over-the-counter NSAID tablets, NSAID meaning Motrin and ibuprofen, one of those pain meds. The pain mostly subsided by the next morning. Peter states he had a similar episode of sudden onset pain upon waking in the morning in his right great toe, but thought he stubbed his toe. So he denies injury, fever, rash, chills, or decreased range of motion. So if you look at his vital, so his height is about five feet, 11 inches. Um, his weight is 239 pounds. He has a history of high blood pressure. He takes 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide, that's a blood pressure medication, once a day, reports drinking beer on most weekends, and his vitals on exam, temperature 98.8, no fever, fever would be 100.3 or above, heart rate is 79, which is kind of okay, 70 is a good heart rate, 
and blood pressure 136 over 78, a little over the normal 120 over 80 for a 41 year old. And breathing is 17 breaths per minute. So 14 to 16 is about normal. So it's a little bit maybe because of the pain, he's breathing a little harder. What do you think is going on? Feel free to um, drop your thoughts in the chat. We have one person who says arthritis. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, a lot of so arthritis or hypertension related pain. Okay. Gout. Any specific type of arthritis? We have gout, which is on oh, here. Okay. Or yeah. osteoarthritis. So, yes, yes. All good, all good differentials. Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout. So gout is what is happening right now, right here. And honestly, gout is one of those diseases where it's really got a classic history. There is one joint involved generally compared to most other um, arthritis where it's, you know, um, different finger joints and back pain and shoulder and knees. Gout happens to have, uh, you know, usually occur in one or two joints at most, um, either the knees or the ankles or the toe. And so that part in history is really key. You've heard of gout, awesome. Good. So we have um, a certain things, to, you know, a certain set of things to worry about with gout. First of all, we want to make sure he's, his symptoms are taken care of with pain. His pain has to be taken care of. Second, we want to avoid what you see right now in this picture, which is TOFI. TOFI are crystal deposits that have been going on for years and years of untreated gout that's causing deformities. And so uh, this causes a lot of pain as well, as you can see, uh, it, it is really disfiguring and deforming. So we want to avoid future gout attacks to prevent uh, these long-term complications. And also um, we have to make sure that we want to make some lifestyle changes and not just medication changes to prevent the gout from uh, progressing or even, you know, sometimes patients, you know, just totally get rid of gout if uh, their blood pressure is controlled, they lose weight, they exercise, they avoid red meat and uh, certain diet, you know, changes that are required to make sure that gout flares don't happen. So how do we diagnose gout? Now I know I said that the clinical scenario is classic for gout, um, where, where the, the particular joint is involved and, and the pain is not severe enough to uh, limit range of motion. You can see here that the patient has, um, you know, uh, denies any decreased range of motion. So let's say if he had fever and he had decreased range of motion and he's not letting anyone touch that joint, then you've got to worry about septic arthritis, which means infection in the joint. So crystal arthritis like gout is usually, even though it's painful, eight out of 10, it won't get to a point where they won't let you touch it at all. So um, there's no easy way to be sure unless you do an exam where you take some fluid out of the joint and you run three tests. You want to look for crystals, you want to look at the cell count, meaning the just like we do blood tests where, where the white blood cells are elevated when there's an infection, the synovial fluid, that's the joint fluid, will have a higher amount of white blood cells, meaning the body is fighting some type of infection. That would happen um, with infection or even any inflammation from crystals as well. Um, and then you want to do um, basically so cell count, crystals, and then you want to look at the bacteria. You want to look for bacteria. So you want to culture. You want to culture that fluid in your microbiology lab 
to see any, if any particular bacteria grows. Um, that would be really, you know, gold standard for managing gout. But we don't always want to poke patients because this is an invasive procedure and you might, you know, actually introduce infection if you don't have a sterile technique. So um, you generally don't want to uh, do this each time if you already have a diagnosis of gout or if it's fitting the criteria and, and actually improves when you do gout treatment. Um, you also want to do a blood test for serum uric acid because uric acid is the crystal that's depositing in these joints. And if you have higher uric acid in your blood from maybe a lot of beer that he was drinking or um, red meat in your diet, so then you want to catch that high serum uric acid and decide if you want to start medications um, in order to reduce that um, high serum uric acid in your blood by either making sure that you pee out the uric acid by certain medications called uricosuric drugs. So um, we don't usually want to do that blood test when the patient is having gout flare because all that uric acid is going to be in the joint and you are going to miss out on a, a potential diagnosis of gout or a chance to start medications to reduce the uric acid dose if you accidentally you know, check that blood test during that episode. So you want to wait about two weeks um, and then check the blood. That's when the gout flare would have gone away with medications such as ibuprofen that he was taking. Or sometimes if it's too bad, we even need to give steroids like prednisone. Um, and then if you find that in two weeks, the serum uric acid is less than six, then you generally don't have to start uh, medications for prophylaxis or preventing gout attacks. Of course, there's other reasons you would start if they have kidney disease or if they have TOFI, that's the complication I showed you, then you have to do it anyway. You have to start those medicines. But this uric acid kind of helps you decide um, what, what next course of action to take. And then there are medications. So medications, like I said, for his symptoms right now, it would, it, it would be ibuprofen or colchicine uh, or um, uh, you know, prednisone, that's for the pain, for immediate relief, uh, for the flare. Unfortunately, some of these medicines like colchicine can itself uh, cause gout attacks and allopurinol, which is the other medication that uh, we want to use to prevent future gout attacks itself can also cause gout. So it's, it's hard and you've got to make your decisions based on each patient it's sometimes we have to give colchicine for three months, which I have a patient right now on three months of colchicine because we want to prevent gout attacks from allopurinol because he had back-to-back -back attacks. Um, and so that, that's also very important to kind of tailor it for each patient. Um, and then you kind of, you know, have to follow up with the serum uric acid and make sure that they don't develop more uh, flares as they go down that time. But you, you should be able to treat uh, blood pressure with medications like losartan, which is one of the blood pressure medicines that are actually good in gout because it helps prevent gout flares. You've got to make choices with every medication, uh, keeping in mind all of the you know, different uh, conditions, that, health conditions that the patient is having. So the hydrochlorothiazide that he was on can actually make it worse, um, the gout flares. So you want to um, avoid that and switch it to a different medication called uh, losartan. Also, low-fat dairy products are really good uh, for preventing gout attacks. So this is my website and I have these because I have a couple of patients who have gout and I, I wrote about different foods that you want to have, like low-fat dairy, cherries, citrus fruits, salmon, certain fish. And those would be good to prevent gout attacks. So we want to make sure we have checked the patient's cholesterol because gout is a new age disease. It, it, it's usually seen with high blood pressure patients, seen in obese patients. So you want to make sure your, the blood pressure is managed well. You, you make sure you've not missed out on high cholesterol and how to manage it in terms of lifestyle changes and medication sometimes. And to make sure that the patient exercises, loses weight um, in order to make sure to live a gout-free life. And this is my website, myhappydoc.com. Thank you uh, for pre-health shadowing for allowing me to discuss about my journey and uh, kind of give you a good picture about um, how uh, the journey towards becoming a physician is like. 
the pros and cons, ups and downs. And you can reach me at myhappydoc.com and I have a, a link to, um, uh, sorry, a contact page where you can reach out to me or you can email me at md at myhappydoctor.com. I'm uh, so happy that I got this chance to talk to you guys. Thank you so much um, for coming and giving your presentation. Um, so we do have a little bit for some student questions. So we can go ahead yeah. and jump into that. Um, all of my students here today, if you would like to ask your question directly, go ahead and click the raise hand function and I can call on you. Um, Jen, it looks like you're excited to ask your question, so go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Munker, how are you? Hello, Jen, I'm good, thank you for asking. How are yeah. you? Well, first, thanks so much for, for being with us and speaking with us, I really appreciate it, it was great. Of course, of course, thank you. Um, my question, I'm sorry, I just ran up the stairs so I could get on camera. It's okay. <laughs> um, so my question for you is, um, so I, one, I don't really know like the specialty that, I'd like to potentially go into if I do get into medical school. Mm -hmm. um, but I am interested in um, like naturopathic medicine. I don't I don't think I necessarily want to go to like a naturopathic med medical school, but I am interested in the idea of like learning more about um, nutrition and um, alternative medication, like supplements and things to yeah. offer to students. So I have a kind of a two part question. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I catch my breath. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first part of my question is um, as an internalist, are you aware of maybe any like fellowships that um, internalists? Um, have available to them that might kind of focus on um, learning more about naturopathic remedies um, that you know you can offer to your patients. And then my second part is um, as a physician that is focused on um, doing what you can to lower the cost for your, your patients. Um, do you find that you in incorporate things like um, like supplements and alternative medications to your patients as a, a means to, you know, help with their costs and things of that yes. nature. Yes, awesome. So great, great questions, because this is literally what I'm seeing right now when I started uh, my practice. Everyone, most of my patients who reached out to me in, in this direct primary care model are essentially having a naturopathic doctor or they have some type of alternative medicine uh, specialist like a Chinese uh, herbal medicine doctor or some of these physicians, uh, in fact, who are internal medicine or family medicine physicians also are trained in Chinese medicine sometimes. So there's, there's I need to make a distinction between this and there's no particular um, you know, there's on social media, there's all kinds of crazy about everything, right? Like, oh my God, naturopathy, blah, blah. And then, and then allopathic is so toxic, right? So it's all, it's all up in the air with, with uh, people's uh, judgments and stuff. But I want to be really clear when I tell you about why um, uh, there is a difference between naturopathic medicine and allopathic medicine. So allopathic medicine or Western medicine, which we train in, um, after, you know, through med school and throughout uh, residency training, no matter which specialty you choose, everything is evidence-based, meaning it has had multiple large research trials that were done before they could, you know, come to a point where they said, hey, you know, this is actually going to help this patient from having gout in the future. And, and the physiology behind it, uh, there, there is a, a particular, let's say, um, uh, ke chemical uh, process that happens. And then th there's a good de defined process and then there's known side effects that we can uh, reverse. So when it comes to naturopathy, um, I am not trained in it. So I really honestly don't know how it works beyond uh, what, what I see patients on. So there are certain patients who are on supplements. I just have to make sure from my Western medicine front to ensure that there's no interactions with my medications that I've prescribed. Because sometimes there's higher bleeding tendencies if uh, certain supplements are used along with uh, medications that I'm using for, let's say, liver disease or something like that. So what I do is I encourage my patients to tell me about the 
different medications from the naturopathic doctor and I can make sure that it's that I have, I give them the data and the facts about what might be dangerous and what to watch for or if it's safe. And then they decide if they want to go forward with it. But there's another um, a new field called lifestyle medicine. And so lifestyle medicine is a fellowship that a lot of uh, physicians who are trained in internal medicine and family medicine kind of go into. Um, it's a board, I think, certified fellowship or uh, not sure if it's board certified, but I have not looked into it because it's expensive. And honestly, a lot of the training you can learn from um, literature that's out there. You can look through um, evidence-based um, journals that you use and there's lifestyle medicine journals. So you don't always have to have that degree um, just for the heck of it. You know, sometimes some people want to learn more uh, just about lifestyle medicine, want to only practice lifestyle medicine. So what is lifestyle medicine? Lifestyle medicine is essentially making sure that you're doing everything in terms of a good, healthy lifestyle. Doesn't mean we are giving supplements. It's still going to be evidence-based medicine but you don't just use medicines as a treatment, but you also kind of do a holistic approach with uh, patients to make sure you know every um, aspect of their lifestyle is also examined and they make sure they make those changes. Because I have a patient right now who literally, he lost 10 pounds by uh, you know running marathons. He had gout and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. I didn't give him any medication for cholesterol, but he's completely switched his high cholesterol from abnormal to normal. And so that is, that is lifestyle medicine to me. And so honestly, I want to give you an answer about the naturopathy part, but I'm not too uh, much aware myself about it. But when my patients uh, are happy with the naturopathic doctors, I know they must be doing something great for them. <laughs> so so um, I, I think that was the answer to the first question. And the second one is affordability. Um, Absolutely, I'm you know doing everything I can in this um, in this you know current situation that we have with the healthcare system where there's too many middlemen. Uh, there's insurance, there's healthcare systems, and uh, now there's like a new layer of nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and sadly, the, even though they were meant to be supporting a team of the physician and you know just in terms of like having a good team at a hospital, let's say with a nurse practitioner, a pharmacist and a physician and you know residents lately they're trying to uh, hire nurse practitioners as replacements for physicians because they're unfortunately i don't know why they they think they can pay them less and get the same amount of work done in terms of how many patients they see and stuff so this model of corporate greed sadly is kind of coming in this uh, era of uh, healthcare and a lot of doctors are unhappy because they are forced to see many patients instead of providing quality care. Um, and, and that's why that's why this model really helps me um, uh, focus on the specifics that really would lead to satisfaction as a physician. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Alan, if you would like to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so I just want to say um, I thought the presentation was really good. Thank you. I think I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Um, and so my question is that, so obviously, like, as part of, like, internal medicine, you have to do a lot of research as, like, a college student. But what would you recommend for a high schooler who's looking into research? Like, what do you think the best avenues for that would be? So um, generally, if you, sadly, in this, you need contacts. I have to be honest with you. It's really about reaching out to people who are doing research projects and then kind of, you know, uh, hounding them to have you on board with it. It's, uh, that's how I made it. If I hadn't applied for electives, um, which were research slash clinical electives after I finished med school, um, which is just because I did my med school back in India, it's a little different. And I, I would say my uh, research focus was more so after finishing med school, even though I did a little bit back in India. I think it's really important to reach out to people. First of all, find out what you like. So if you know it's internal medicine, let's say, what do you like about it? Do you like the heart? Do you like the lungs? Do you like, and then the convenience, do you have a university close by where they're you know, focused on a particular type of research and they're looking for volunteers? So it would be really awesome to look at bigger programs or institutes 
uh, that are doing some sort of research and you don't have to be honestly like one of the first authors on the publication. It doesn't matter as long as you kind of help them in maybe data collection or something uh, on your end, uh, it kind of gives you a little bit of a name in that publication or even a 10th author, it doesn't matter. You can still put it on your CV. So amount of time you want to spend on research is really up to you. If, if you think it's more for your CV, you don't enjoy research, but because you want to have a good um, curriculum vitae to have a nice chance for a good med school in the future, um, it would be nice to focus on, um, you know, bigger institutes, but any small, any small uh, uh, project would still make a big difference versus if you're really interested in it, you want to do like lab studies where you're sitting with rats and like dissecting them and stuff, you can go for it. You can ask them for opportunities for that. But really one thing I tell you, don't hesitate to reach out. Don't hesitate to reach out to professors, assist assistant professors. They're all busy, but but honestly, I there's a hit rate, right? Like I, I got one out of uh, 50 people to actually accept me and I went to UC Davis. And I still ask my, I still ask that professor, how did you even accept, like the, what, what made you accept me, right? And so there's always good people. You never know where. And, and all you have to do is put in that effort and you know, put that extra work in um, that they might expect to, to get some of those uh, research projects in. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um... I'm sorry, I, I hope I don't say your name wrong. Um, Omala, if you would like to ask your question. It's Omalis, um, but thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Munker. I really admire your work. This is the first time I've ever heard of anything related to direct primary care. So, Yay. Yeah, so going off of that, I was wondering um, what you see or what you want for the future of my happy doctor. Or do you have like a plan set up? Do you have a dream? Um, what's that like for you? That's awesome. Thank you. I mean, this is honestly, I felt at my lowest, like I really felt so crappy when I had to leave my job. Um, it was right after I graduated, I went into an insurance-based clinic where I had to work with a team of doctors who are already used to the insurance-based drama, you know? It's like, oh, you know, patient was prescribed metformin, but it's not glucophage, which is one of the brands of metformin. And because I didn't prescribe that, the patient never got the medication for months. And then they're trying to call the clinic and then there's a call center and, and it's never reaching me. And then they see me in two months and they're already much worse with their diabetes. And then there's patients who, um, this is just like a five minute quick patient visit, right? Because there's so many patients and the medical assistant keeps knocking on my door to move on to that next patient. Um, and so it is, it was really stressful because when you start off, you have all these hopes, high hopes about being this best doctor. And, and uh, you kind of notice that the system is not supporting you. There were patients who needed CAT scans because I wanted to, wanted to see why they were losing 150 pounds, which generally happens if it's, if they're losing so much weight in like a month or so, that means either cancer or some chronic infection like TB, um, tuberculosis. So I wanted to get CAT scans and they wouldn't approve the CAT scan. The image, you know, the insurance company just absolutely wouldn't. And I had to be on the phone with the insurance doctor to try and explain to them. So it's honestly a system created with, with middlemen who have no faces. So the patient sees me, the patient is unhappy because I couldn't get the CT scan for them. They're unhappy, I couldn't get the metformin for them. And so my dream for my happy doctor is honestly, I will be a happy doctor if my patients are happy, right? And so for them to be happy, what do I need? For internal medicine, I don't need to do surgeries. I just need my stethoscope. I need to be present with the patient so I can do house calls. I need to uh, have uh, access to blood tests. So I try to get really low prices on them. And for $50 a month membership, my patients get 90% discount on labs and you know x-rays for $50, really reasonable compared to uh, thousands of dollars that insurance company bills. Um, and sometimes patients have high deductible insurance meaning the initial portion, uh, about $7,000, some of my patients have to pay out of pocket until insurance kicks in and starts paying. 
So this 50 or 50, 7,500, depending on your age, dollars a month, really keeps all their costs low and I'm available anytime they need me. So it's like Netflix, right? It's like, you want to watch a movie? You binge on movies, you binge on healthcare. And so this is a new concept. And my dream is to have a panel of say 150 to 250 patients. And I know them really well and I'm there to support them and not have this uh, you know, constant need to keep getting more patients. And you know, I'll, I'll probably make 250K, which I was making as a salaried uh, doctor. So that's reasonable enough for me. So my dream is to just have a good, happy patient panel. <laughs> that's so amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Um, Kilani, if you would like to ask your question. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was really cool. And I've really, okay. like, this is my first, um, I think, session with pre-health um, shadowing. So it was a really good experience for me. Um, totally unrelated. I think your work and like your talk and direct patient care really seems like something that would come up from a show that I'm watching right now. And that's new Amsterdam on Netflix. So I'm really like, yeah, so it's really cool. Um, my question though was um, earlier on, you mentioned something about um, having less options for specialty as an immigrant. I just wanted to ask, was there any other disadvantage that you faced being an immigrant at all, aside from having less specialty? Thank mm -hmm. you. That's an awesome, awesome question because it really made a difference um, when I was seeing other uh, people who had the same scores as me on the USMLE exams. And I could see that they had research less than the amount of research projects that I had done. Um, there was more elective rotations that I did. It all came down to visa. It all came down to visa. So it really, honestly, with the, with the turmoil that's going on recently, uh, pre-COVID and all the crazy that was going on in terms of politics, um, there's been a lot of laws about um, the H-1B visa, which is one of the big visas that we use for doctors and engineers, et cetera. There's been a clamp down on that by the administration, uh, previous administration. And so there was a huge issue uh, for new residents who were coming, you know, med school uh, graduates who are coming out of India and all these, you know, Pakistan, lots of different um, INGs, that, that's very common. We, um, most of our nation, uh, Nathan's healthcare system or hospitals are full of international medical graduates because we need we need that amount of um, uh, workforce and and sadly now because of the visa issues a lot of times people don't match um, uh, and I had to call literally every program in California and tell them hey I have a work permit and you don't have to sponsor a visa for me because it's not green card, it's not citizenship. So they find it hard to understand what it is. And honestly, like some of the, some of the programs, they just sent me an email with an interview right after I hung up. So it really needs to be some sort of education for programs as well, because they're not familiar with immigration uh, paperwork. And, and it did help to make those phone calls in California and I could match at UCSF Fresno. Whereas if I had not made those phone calls, I'd probably be in New York or something, you know, and, and honestly, New York is awesome, but my husband's here, so we can't, you know, long distance is really uh, difficult. Um, so great question. And I think, I think it's important to put that extra effort if you are an immigrant. Yeah, thank you. I'm actually also like an international student from like Nigeria as well. So that's why I'm like uh -huh. really curious about that. Um, another follow-up question that I had was like, um, like if, India is anything like Nigeria where I grew up from, like um, students are not really known to um, go out and pursue opportunities. So how are you able to like distinguish yourself and like pursue those kind of opportunities back home before coming here? Because like, I know like um, getting a student like you like must have been like, I guess like an exceptional student or something. And I was just really curious, like what kind of opportunities did you um, do in your undergrad or at med school that set you apart? Awesome, awesome question. So I did do pharmacology uh, projects, um, honestly, because of peer pressure. So everyone was doing research projects and I was like, oh my God, I got to do something. And so then I went begging <laughs> to a pharmacology professor who honestly was the nicest guy and let me uh, join this project where we were you know, using mice um, to kind of give them this um, medic it's medication, more of a plant extract we were trying to study. Um, and this extract would 
uh, be an analgesic. So they were trying to see how many times the mice were licking their pads, you know, and that's when they feel pain. So if they, if they were taking a longer time to start licking their pads, that means it's having an analgesic effect. And so that was the first research project I ever worked in. And it was kind of cool. Uh, obviously didn't put in a lot of time or effort in it, but it was a good exposure towards that and then um, towards research. And then I could even present it at certain uh, local, you know, uh, med, med student presentations. Um, so it really is about asking. If you want something, no matter who you are and how exceptional or unexceptional you think you are, you just go and ask for it. If you feel like you want to be something, don't ever look at any circumstantial uh, situations to be a reason not to ask, right? So I knew that I wanted to come to the US because my husband was here. Otherwise I would have probably been a doctor in India right now. It's circumstances. He was here, it wasn't because I had a dream of coming to the US, but now it's awesome. I love this, I love the situation I'm in. So everything is situational, but if you feel like you want to ask um, for, you know, want to get something, you get, go, go get your dream. You just have to um, put yourself out there and, and, and not worry about the consequences. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you so much um, for answering questions today. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time for this session. Um, so I'd just like to open the floor for any last advice that you want to give. And if it's okay, I'm gonna put your email in the chat so that uh, any students can reach out to you because we definitely had a lot of questions today. Sounds good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I think uh, my, my big piece of advice is Ikigai. That Japanese concept, I think is really, really important because many times we just look at what the other person is doing, people around us are doing and just get into this rat race, right? And, and we don't always have to stop somewhere. I became just another primary care doctor, but I'm one of the few who, who's doing direct primary care. So you don't know what you're gonna become um, just follow the path, but in the end, you want to really focus on what makes you happy while practicing your skill and your career. Whatever you choose, you could still practice, let's say, physical therapy by not taking insurance and making sure you do house calls. And you still have that awesome experience without, um, uh, you know, uh, dealing with middlemen. So it really is about Ikigai, and I wish you all the best of luck. You can reach me at md at myhappydoctor.com if you have any questions, because this process is rigorous and really testing all the time. I mean, the USMLE exams are like, honestly, eight hour exams and, and it's, it's testing your patience and your uh, and endurance during that exam. So um, it's not fair because we don't want to, we, we don't want to scare doctors away, but it's honestly, that's the only process they have right now. So please, please, please work towards, um, you know, just making sure you don't ever hesitate to ask for help down this path. Don't hesitate to ask for it. If they don't help, if someone doesn't help, that's, that's okay. You can keep asking for help elsewhere. But this journey is all about making connections with the right people, um, you know, reaching out for electives, research, and, and doing your exams well and studying for them. Good luck. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I had a lovely time. I think I'll, I think a lot of people learned from the session and got a lot out of it as well, just from briefly glancing at the chat. So thank you thank so you. much again. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Esther. I'm so happy to be here. We are so happy to have you. Um, all my <laughs> students, feel free to stick around for short wrap-up presentation so I can walk you through how to get your post-shadowing certificate to verify your virtual shadowing, shadowing hours for today. Um, okay, let me share my screen. And Dr. Munkar, you can feel free to stick around if you want, but you're more than welcome to um, log off. And we thank you yeah. so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, everybody. So we just like to, you know, put some little questions out there, ask you, what brought you to the session today? What are three major takeaways that you got from the session? And what do you want to learn more about? Of course, these are not required, um, but we do encourage you to, you know, jot your thoughts down, um, get them on paper, get them on a Google Doc, whatever it is, because these are 
so it's so important to be able to look back on this when you're writing that med school application when you are you know writing when you're putting stuff in your cover letter for your resume thinking about what got you to this point what is inspiring you to get into medicine and who like our wonderful professional today has inspired you to keep going so um, we also encourage you, if you do write um, a short paragraph of reflection or anything else that you would like to share with us, be sure to submit it to www.preoscattering.com slash blog submissions, and you can get it published on our website. And this is great to put on CVs, applications, and resumes as well, and just get some recognition for your hard work. If you are interested in being a part of pre-health shadowing, um, be sure to go ahead and you can become a volunteer with us or you can even become a team member and be up here with me and one of our other administrative members and lead um, team tasks. So that is very exciting and it is great to constantly find different perspectives from different people. So we encourage you to apply for each of these opportunities. If you're a volunteer, you can work asynchronously and just kind of build up those volunteer hours as you can. So we humbly ask that if you can, you please donate. Um, of course, we don't expect it and it's not a requirement, but we do know that it is, um, that we are giving this opportunity to a lot of students who otherwise not be able to afford it. So if you can afford to put a dollar or two towards our cause, that'd be great. So we can continue to keep our website up and running, keep our Zoom and get everything going. So now, um, everybody if you are here to take our post shadowing assessment um, it will be ready in a few minutes but um just give us a few seconds to get it put in there um but once so what you can do is you're going to go onto our website and you're going to find our professional course for today and you are going to click free take this course once you have done that you are going to click take this quiz and you are going to take a 10 question multiple choice quiz based entirely on the presentation here today. Um, you have you just have to pass with a 70% or higher, which is seven out of 10 from multiple choice questions, pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Um, if you're paying attention, you'll get it no problem. Our, our quizzes are open indefinitely, so you can take it at any point after the session ends today. You will have 30 minutes per try, and you have two attempts to take this post-shadowing assessment. We give you two attempts because we know that sometimes the internet is spotty and all of that. If so, you will have a second opportunity. If you continue to run into issues, then you can be sure to email us at prehealthshadowing.com. We will make sure that you get your certificate. Um, also, I will be sticking around after the session if you have direct questions or need some help navigating our website. So, but once you are done taking your quiz, once you've gotten your 70% or higher, just click finish this course and you can download your certificate. By the way, nobody sees your grade on this, okay? You get these, you get two hours of virtual shadowing on your certificate regardless of what you score on that quiz, as long as it was above 70%. So I encourage you to just take it. If you did miss a part of our session today, don't worry because um, this recording will be up on YouTube by the end of the night. We record all of our virtual shadowing sessions and events to allow our students to go back and watch them um, whenever they want. So you can go back on our website, you can go and see previous sessions that we've recorded, previous professionals that we've talked to. We've talked to a variety of nurses, doctors, PhD holders, um, masters in public health, um, you know, PTs, OTs, RNs, the works. So if any of those specialties appeal to you, go on our website and check out some of those videos from past sessions. You can also take the post shadowing assessments for those sessions as well and build up those virtual shadowing hours. Be sure to uh, catch our sessions, which are going on every weekday through June. We are booked, which is awesome. So that means we are going to get to share a ton of different experiences with you and talk to a um, bunch of different professionals. So I hope to see you guys there and make sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok as well as sign up for our email list. Okay, so everybody, I'd love to draw your attention again to a wonderful event we are going to hold this again in honor of Women's History Month. Um, I am going to be um, facilitating a discussion with an all-female professional panel to talk about some of the disparities that people who identify as female 
deal with as they are going into medicine and as they are both patients and providers. I think this is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other and to learn about some of the things that perhaps we weren't aware of as speech professionals going into the field, as well as get some real like, firsthand experience from people who are patients and providers on both sides of this issue. So if you want to reserve your free seat today, go ahead and scan the QR code or um, stick around and I can drop the link in the chat as well. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them too. So again, there's no limit on how many people can attend. We just want to get a head count so we can send out the email with the Zoom link for you. So thank you guys all for joining our virtual shadowing session today. Um, I will be sticking around with a couple of my other team members to answer any questions if you have any. But um, other than that, our session is over and I invite you all to log off. Thank you so much for joining us.